I knew very little about Arctic foxes before I volunteered as part of a research team helping to monitor these wonderful creatures in Iceland. The team is headed by Esther Root, a mammal ecologist at the Icelandic Institute of Natural History. She's a determined, inspirational woman whose knowledge of Arctic foxes is outstanding. Arctic foxes are Iceland's only native terrestrial mammal, which established themselves on the island long before humans arrived in the 10th century. They remained on Iceland as the ice cap retreated northwards after the last ice age. With the settlement of humans to Iceland, a turbulent relationship emerged between man and fox. The Arctic fox was admired, but also hated. It was hunted extensively for its valuable fur pelt, as well as in retaliation amidst fears of damage to livestock. Den hunting was, and still is, carried out to this day. This is one of the oldest paying jobs in Iceland, which involves killing all the foxes at a particular den. The Hornstrandir Nature Reserve is one of the very few places in Iceland where the foxes are protected and where den hunting is prohibited. There is a difficult balance to be struck with history, tradition, maintaining people's livelihoods and the future of Arctic fox populations. Arctic foxes are found throughout Iceland, but are most densely populated and concentrated in the West Fjords, as this region has an extensive coastline as well as large bird cliffs. There are two main ecotypes of foxes in Iceland, the inland ecotype and the coastal ecotype. The latter feeds mainly on seabirds, eggs, invertebrates and carrion washed up on the shore. It has been found that these coastal foxes have accumulated high levels of mercury in their tissues as a result of bioaccumulation up the food chain. Foxes cache food in the summer so that they have enough to sustain themselves during the harsh winters. As the only native terrestrial mammal on the island, the Arctic fox plays an important role as an apex predator in the ecosystem. These foxes are exceptionally well adapted to life in this unforgiving landscape. They endure harsh temperature extremes, but amazingly, they don't start to shiver until the temperature drops to minus 70 degrees Celsius. They have a very dense, multi-layered coat of fur, which provides the best insulation of any mammal, and they have fur covering their foot pads as well. Their compact body shape provides a low surface area to volume ratio, meaning that less of its surface is exposed to the cold, and therefore less heat escapes from the body. They come in two different colour morphs, white and blue. The white foxes are almost completely white in the winter, but bi-coloured in the summer, so they have seasonal camouflage. The blue morph is dark brown and it keeps its colour throughout the year, but the sun bleaches the colour in late winter, so it's hard to distinguish between the two forms at this time of year. There's limited genetic mixing between the foxes in the West Fjords and the rest of the country's population. So around 80% of the foxes in this part of the country are of the blue morph colour type. The Arctic foxes in Iceland breed every year, which is different to Arctic fox populations elsewhere within their range. This is thought to be due to the fact that in other areas, fox fertility is linked to the abundance of lemmings, which is a key prey source. As there are no lemmings in Iceland, these fluctuations in fertility and breeding are not seen. Arctic foxes form strong pair bonds and they often stay together for life. The gestation period of an Arctic fox is around 57 days and most cubs are born in late May. The cubs feed on the mother's milk for around three to four weeks, after which time they start chewing on solid food and they spend more time outside the den. Both parents defend the territory and care for the cubs as they are growing, tirelessly going out, hunting and bringing them back food. The male fox hardly ever goes into the den, so at the start of the breeding season, he usually still has thick winter fur on both sides of his body, whereas the female's fur is lost as she goes in and out of the narrow den entrances. Dens can be made up of a single entrance or a network of burrows. Good den sites tend to be used year after year. Holding onto a good territory with a suitable den site is vital if the fox pair are to breed successfully. 
Foxes communicate with each other through a series of loud barks which carry across the landscape. They also scent mark regularly along their territorial borders. Getting to spend time observing these foxes for six hour shifts every day was a truly remarkable experience. It doesn't really get dark, so there's not really a time limit of when you need to be back in the evenings. That's the beauty of field work this close to the Arctic Circle. I remember being bitterly cold. The air is icy even with not much of your face being exposed, and every part of your body feels like it's losing sensitivity. Let me tell you that I've never been as utterly freezing in my entire life. All the while, you're trying to scan the area and listen for any signs of movement. And when the weather does clear, it's the most fantastic feeling being able to see for miles, and even more exciting when you can hear the foxes barking or see them in the distance, moving about in their territory with such ease and grace. I feel incredibly humbled to have had the experience of being part of this monitoring team, and I hope that this research can continue for many years to come. Increasing our knowledge about Arctic foxes and the way in which they interact with their environment is vital in order to safeguard the future of this remarkable species. There's a little part of my soul left in that rugged, wild, phenomenal landscape with the Arctic foxes.